every collecting hobby has that, you know, and it's an overused term, but that holy grail of collecting. And the rocket firing Boba Fett, it's like, to baseball card collecting, the Hannes Wagner T206 card, every collecting genre has one of those. And you got a panel here of the experts in the world that will tell you about it from very different perspectives. So I want to introduce to you Chris Jorgulius, Brian Rackfell, and Jim Swearingen. All right, folks. Is this on? Hello. Yes. Um, I'm Chris. Thanks for coming. I'm super excited about this panel. I'm psyched to see the place filled up. Um, I want to introduce uh, Brian and then um, to my very right, Jim Swearingen, who is uh, one of the old school <laughs> Kenner guys. He worked in. Yeah. Jim, Jim was uh, in a pr preliminary design, and he has a hand in one of the big pieces you will see here. Jim, you want to tell everybody yeah, a little bit about your background? Yeah, I was, uh, I started Kenner in 72. Uh, in 74, we started preliminary design, and in 77, I was the first person to read the script for Star Wars. <laughs> and got to uh, press the management at Kenner to do the whole project. And got to present to 20th Century Fox and George Lucas and uh, convince them that this little toy company in Cincinnati could do the project. So those are, that's when I had hair. <laughs> I was 27 when I started in Star Wars. And uh, that picture of, uh, of uh, the mayor of Cincinnati, Jerry Springer, <laughs> Just a little better. He was declaring it Star Wars Day in Cincinnati, and I got to present him with his set of the first 12 figures. And the other picture is me with the R2-D2 that we built for Toy Fair of 1979. Uh, and bell bottoms were in, and I had platform shoes, I think. <laughs> but I had a great time. I was fortunate enough to really get things started. It was a great great experience and uh, I worked on it for the first two and a half years and uh, kind of left in the middle of The Empire Strikes Back. And then the history is now I show up at these things and talk about the good times at Kenner. That's right. And you probably have seen Jim on The Toys That Made Us on Netflix. Yeah. All right. Thanks for the intro, Jim. We're, let's get rolling in here and Show these people some Boba Fetts. Um, this is sort of like a glory beauty shot of, of many variations of the Rocket Fetts that have turned up over the years. Um, we'll get into some more details on some of those, but you can kind of see I mean, when you're engineering a figure, you know, they're shooting them in different colors. They were practicing with you know, hand painting, um, different variations in there just to sort of like tease you here. But we're going to start with where'd Boba Fett come from? Start way at the beginning. So Boba Fett, you know, was uh, actually started sketching with um, Ralph McQuarrie, late 77, early 78. They were coming up with the idea of a super stormtrooper, a super trooper. So that's why you see these early sketches. They're white, and they're experimenting with different shapes here. Um, I say they. It started with Ralph um, morphing uh, the design here and then turned it over to Joe Johnston, early 78, where he took that super trooper and more refined it into the Boba Fett character. And you can see, and there's tons of photos, uh, it, such images online, lots of these sketches are around. This gets you a kind of a flavor of what was going on at the time. Um, they abandoned the Super Trooper concept because it was going to be too expensive to build an uh, elite squad of Super Storm Troopers. So they took this design they were really excited about and created uh, the Boba Fett Bounty Hunter. And... Um, and turned it over pretty early to Kennedy. See, this is January, March 78, tail end of what he, uh, Joe Johnson had done. And Jim had done this sketch in April of 78, based highly, or copied, or traced off the, uh, <laughs> off the Joe Johnston sketch. Um, Jim, do you remember why you would have needed to bring something like this to do in-house? Well, it, at the time, it was going to be a top secret project. And uh, Lucas didn't want anybody else to know. And preliminary design was an area where you were not allowed to come just off around, you know, wander around. We had key cards and had to be uh, invited in. This sketch just uh, came after the, this, the uh, kit bashed. 
So this sketch always came later, even the yeah. It, this came a little later because we got Joe Johnson and stuff after we took photographs. So we were clearing up. He was giving us some more information about what the figure we saw in the photographs was. But it's uh, uh, we were we would use this for talk around, probably uh, engineering uh, cost engineering. So we were. Uh, we would lay things out and then do a breakdown of parts. Yeah. So, so. Um, and then on the Lucasfilm side, they were turning this sketch into something in reality. And, and by the end of June, they did a screen test of the costume. Um, ben Bird is doing the uh, introduction here, and they, they've got um, uh, Dwayne Dunham, I think, was the model wearing the outfit. And he is Boba Fett in this, even though he's white. Um, they show the, the features. And, um, and that was late June, and then sort of like, then they start morphing. Oh, we lost one of the pictures here in the conversion. Uh, the top fit photo was showing Joe Johnson actually painting the helmet. The, the early version of the helmet had the horns on the head. And you can see there, they, they sort of really quickly went from the white design to the, the more colored design, gave him the Clint Eastwood poncho. And, um, and then uh, in July 78, Jim went to Lucasfilm, took yeah. these photos. Yeah, they, they had an actor dress up. This is the first view of, of the, real, the, the real thing for us. So they uh, obviously took turnaround. We took turnarounds, and then that's where the kit bash came from. That's uh, Dave Okada in the middle, and George Lucas when he was showing us the costume. I unfortunately didn't turn the camera over to David, so you don't have any pictures of me with Boba Fett. But uh, this is the one that we, we started doing the kit bash with. That's right. And there were more photographs, but uh, those have long since uh, gone away. These are the last two that I actually kept on. Yeah. So yeah. it was a great trip. It was like, you know, secret agent. You got to go out and take some photographs and come back and then get them, you know, not tell anybody what was going on for a while. Yeah, and Dave is... Uh, uh, Jim's boss at the time, and Dave yeah. is also seen on the toys that made us. Yeah. And uh, so Jim came back from this trip, and he, he's, Jim's referring to Kit Bash, and we'll get into that, what, what he's talking about. But Jim came, you know, when he created the first concept model of Boba Fett, which is this guy we, the collectors refer to as the Kit Bash Fett. So yeah. Jim had already had some experience taking pieces of action figures. He made some of the first concept Star Wars figures out of Fisher Price figures. And this one was developed after the, the Star Wars stories. And you can see where he took these parts of these three action figures um, to get the body. Um, the head, we're not 100% sure if it's a started as a stormtrooper or a Darth Vader, but he mostly sculpted it out of Sculpey and then took the missile feature from that Shogun Warriors Raider figure. Yeah. This, I, I, every once in a while, people introduce me as a sculptor. I am not a sculptor. <laughs> we had some really talented ones at Kenner. But this one was... Uh, Instead of kit bashing like we did on the original, the original 11 that I did, uh, this was made from our own parts, which was really handy. Uh, see through his body and the arms from stormtroopers. An X Acto knife is my tool of choice, and uh, body putty is my sculpting material. At the head, it's hard to tell. I needed a head that was big enough, there was enough vinyl to carve away with my X Acto knife. And I sacrificed one of my robots for the uh, rocket firing mechanism on the back. The model shop actually built his armor for his chest, and they took my uh, the the arm of one of my uh, ro uh, robots and added the jet packs to the side and uh, modified it to fit on the figure. So th this made it a lot easier using our own parts because they actually fit together. And then he. This poor guy was used for lots of photography and many presentations in secret with uh, retailers uh, so that no one, uh, you know, they were all sworn to secrecy. But it's uh, a lot looser than the ones that you see now. So yeah. there's just, actually, I've, I have the, uh, the reproduction out of Singapore that <laughs> is a lot cleaner than the sculpture that I actually worked on. Yeah. Yeah, so it's highly detailed and, and um, you know, very representative of the character. 
And um, you know, the term kit bash came from model making. You take model kits and bash them together. You're taking parts and putting them and making something new from existing parts. Um, so we get into the backpack Jim mentioned, a little mm -hmm. more detail, and you can see how the um, missile firing feature was converted. You know, they added the, uh, the jet pods um, and more features on the backpack with, you know, probably styrene pieces. Uh, it was very detailed in terms of paint coloring. Um, they took that Shogun missile, basically they just turned it down on a lathe and made it that nice, sharp, pointy version. And the last version is one where they sort of they get to like, like a cost-reduced version, and we'll get into that figure, uh, that version of it later. But you can see they actually cut the jet pods off, repainted it, so it's two colors from like seven colors. And then they went back to the more rounded tip missile there. And then Jim mentioned you know, um, this is used for photography. One of the places it was seen, a lot of collectors have seen it, is, uh, was used in the insert for the vinyl carrying case. Um, and he's shown up in some other places in early Kenner photography. Sometimes they'd shoot something and they would use the same photos over and over, um, especially in the days before Photoshop when you had to actually cut and paste things. But um, this was a good, this was a way for kids uh, to, to show this early on. And a lot of people get this, like, what the heck is this figure in here? But this figure actually morphed a few times in-house. Um, the very first version had a slick vinyl cape to mimic that, that poncho um, style, but that was dropped pretty early. You can see he has a metal range finder. Um, the second one's more like the classic kit bash. The third one, I think it's, I don't get, I, I'm not sure if it's completely repainted or if it's just an exposure, but basically they took the, 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 the details off the boot, the black details and then the horns came off of the head. And the very last version is sort of like the final version of this figure um, where it was, the, the paint operations were reduced and you end up with the, uh, the more simplified backpack. And these are a couple of shots. The, 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 the left two images were photographs of the, the, the toy and those were converted to um, like airbrush artwork and that was used for Kenner's promotions. And you guys that know the uh, old toy line, you've seen this before. These are the pieces of artwork. Um, these two pieces of artwork still exist to this day, and they were used for the back of the, the packaging. And then getting into like more late summer, early fall, Kenner released this uh, on the sale, sales side, getting into the marketing. This was released to some retailers. Um, this new character coming out, you know, from the from the sequel of Star Wars, and one of the the, the blow up I put in there says, shows a, you know, the exclusive feature: rocket firing backpack with two spring launched rockets. So everything was on its way, and you know, we gotten up to to this point, and Brian's going to start talking about the actual engineering of the figure in house. Hello. Okay. Oh, there we go. Oh, oh. <laughs> okay. Um, well, what you're looking at here is the actual original sculpt for the Boba Fett action figure. And you can see how they sculpted around this little uh, plastic buck there, there, so they already knew where they were going to contain the uh, firing mechanism. These wax sculpts would generally be a little bit uh, bigger than the finalized figure because when the uh, plastic would cool, they would shrink a little. So this is probably about, about four inches if they were trying to create a three and three quarter inch action figure. They're often very fragile, and I don't know if you can see it on the image there, but um, there's a little crack in the leg there where this figure was, uh, was mended. And it's also kind of a foreboding there, as you see. It does not look like a rocket fit. It looks a lot like what uh, we got in the, uh, in the mail. Some uh, close-ups of the uh, sculpt. Um, what they would do at, after the stage here is they would uh, do a resin, uh, not a resin, they would do a... Um, silicon mold and pour resin hard copies that they would use for uh, tooling, paint masters, photography. And those were difficult to uh, create. They were also very delicate and would break. So what they would do in-house in the model shop, they would create um, prototype molds out of aluminum and they would create uh, proto-mold figures like this one here. And these figures would have a tendency to be a bit uh, rough and differ from other prototypes and production figures that would follow. In the case of the rocket fit here, you can see the uh, mechanism's a bit crude. This is the first time they married the rocket firing um, feature to the production sculpt. It's open at the top, it dips below the latch. Some people call this a T-slot, some call it a proto-L. Proto-mo figures would be completely white, fully painted. 
And uh, what makes this particular example so interesting is that it turns out to be the um, surviving photo sample. And <clears throat> one of the ways we're able to vet this is that um, it looks like that wrist gauntlet was painted orange originally. And then later they went back to Jim's original uh, paint scheme and painted it red. It's an artifact that shows up in photography and I always thought it was kind of a remnant of the flash and lighting, but it actually is, was initially painted uh, to match um, the original kitbashed vet before it uh, disappeared. And you can see on the left image there where I took the colors back to it, the original um, colors there. And also in the hand we found a little residue of uh, beeswax where the gun was uh, held. Uh, to, the, uh, to the right, you have um, photo, um, uh, photo art. What they would do is take the original images that were taken by the uh, Kenner photographer, and they would go through and they would idealize them through airbrushing. And they would do this to accentuate details, add motion, and in the case of this one particular uh, protomal to hide uh, defects that were there and kind of clean up the images for marketing. And you can see the, uh, where these iconic images were used to the uh, left for the uh, original uh, bin display that featured the, uh, the rocket firing mechanism before they covered things up with the ugly little black sticker. The uh, proto mold also shows up in the um, second uh, collector case insert, so we're always we're looking at a uh, rocket vet shows up on the uh, bell display and numerous other uh, places of marketing, even on the back of the 21-back um, uh, carded figures. And I think that particular image goes on into the Empire Strikes Back titles, I think like the 41-back uh, cards. And in the, on the far right there, you can see the, uh, a Canadian bilingual card where instead of just covering up the rocket firing mechanism when they, uh, they canceled that uh, portion of the project, they would put the little sticker of the uh, proto mold on there, which I think makes that a very interesting uh, card back because this is the first time you can really see the proto mold next to the uh, kit bashed figure. Now what you're looking at here are actual first shots. These would have been uh, taken from uh, production molds while they were uh, being created. And these are um, L slots here. The firing mechanism has been uh, cleaned up a bit. It's not open at the top. It doesn't dip below the latch anymore. So th these are more idealized. No copper out on the back of the legs at this point. The proto mold didn't have them either. Uh, but there would be peg holes on the bottom of the feet. Because the colors are so unique, I think these are probably created very early on when they weren't really concerned so much about how uh, the figures would finally look. They were just kind of looking to see if they were getting the right results out of the molds. The interesting thing about the yellow fit is when it was found, they found it with this um, white missile, which everyone thought was uh, probably a proto uh, prototype missile. But we now know the four-sided missile design was locked with the uh, proto mold. So I'm not too sure what was going on here. It could just be as simple that this figure was found without a missile and someone found a part that could fit in there. Or because these were being t uh, taken from production molds, uh, being told outside of the Kenner's influence, maybe they didn't have the missile tooled yet and there was a part that was kind of just kind of um, ad hoc to put in there to see, just to check the form and function of everything. Two more uh, first shots here. The one on the left is the most common uh, rocket fit that you're going to uh, find. It's blue-gray and it's usually the one that you'll find paired with a uh, four-sided missile. The figure next to it is something a little more special. It's still a first shot, but it's further along in the development of things. The copyright has been added to the uh, back of the legs. And the missile here, when these figures were found, they were found with um, eight-sided missiles. Uh, three figures, three eight-sided missiles uh, were found together by one collector. And I think the reason they did this is that the four-sided missiles, when they're fired, they have a tendency to tumble a little bit. And the eight-sided missiles being more circular, they, they, they fire smoother. It's still not going to give you a lot of range. These things, when you fire them, will fire between maybe two inches and two feet. It all depends if you're having a lucky day. <laughs> well, unfortunately, it's true. Um, here, what they did with some of these, um, some of these first shots, uh, they would hand paint them at Canner also for, for purposes of, of uh, photography and such. Uh, we figure there were at least five or six made. Of those, about four have been recovered, two in production paint scheme and two in non-production paint scheme. The, 
This is one of the non-production uh, paint schemes colors here. You can see how the backpack is really nicely embellished. There is at least one other example out there. Excuse me a second. There's at least one other example out there. We don't have permission to show the image, but I do have permission to share the fact that it is relatively um, different than this one here. The question that has been asked a couple times of me is, why would they do this? I mean, if they already, again, like the missile, if they already have it locked with the proto mold and the production scheme color was pretty much locked with the proto mold, why would they do this? The gentleman who painted this particular figure was trying to sell the concept to Kenner that they could do a little more of a better job painting their figures, and he painted up at least a 12 inch Boba Fett to try and sell the concept, which did not go over. And this might just be an artifact from, you know, from that idea there. But Kenner only would usually generally use two or three colors for their figures, and Boba Fett already had about five, so that might have been asking for too much anyway because, well, with the rocket firing mechanism, it was already kind of the Cadillac of uh, Star Wars figures. <laughs> now, I think here is where another Painted Owl shows up. In the, the original long catalog that would be uh, inserted with the vehicle and play sets, it's kind of a postage stamp image. You can't really tell much. The figure next to it is the proto mold again. But fortunately, the transparency for that little postage stamp image does survive. And we're able to kind of blow it up really nice and large. And here's a better image of it. And I kind of use, a, I use Photoshop to kind of show you what I think the back would be if we could magically turn it around. It's not a proto mold. Um, it, has, it does not have the neck gap that the proto mold figure has. Uh, the first shot figure seemed to fit very snugly. It does appear to be hand painted, and you figure the time frame that they would be working with to get stuff to photography, they really wouldn't have had time to get any of the non-firing figures in. So in all likelihood, this is a painted L. But it also has an eight-sided missile, which kind of furthers my theory that they were going to move away with these regardless of how they tooled the backs. And this eight-sided missile is a prototype that still retains the circular ejector pin marks from the previous four-sided missile. And that's basically for the part that would push the missile out of the mold. To authenticate these things, it gets to be a bit difficult because, as you can see here, there are different backs that were, um, that were, um, that were in existence at different times. I don't know if they were working off of different mold cavities or if they were just refining the slot. But you can see you know, one slants off to the left, one is more rounded, the other one's more squared off. And what's interesting with the, uh, the image in the center there is you can see the little post that rises up from the back of the figure. At least I hope you can see it. Yeah, there it is, maybe. Anyway, um, that just, it was that simple little post that held everything in place. For the proto mold, they had a whole separate um, piece of plastic in there to kind of uh, close everything off. And before I go to the next slide, you can see the four-sided missile there unobscured. Now that gets us kind of to the end game. Kenner felt the toy was not going to be safe enough, so they wanted to put in a safety mechanism. So they slimmed down the slot and turned the J-latch design into a J-latch. And the idea was that this way here, a child could not accidentally uh, fire the missile into their eye or wh whatever. Uh, these were fully finalized figures here. They're not hand-painted anymore. They're painted by mass. Copyright is added to the back of the legs. And we figure about 100 were sent into, uh, into uh, the labs for testing in these little uh, bags, sealed with two missiles and a blaster each. The little white box next to it was its own um, separate prototype. The idea was is that the labs, they put the, uh, the two together and do, they would do tumble tests and things like that. And so in theory, this is what we would have got. And we'll get to, get to the reason we didn't get it in a moment here. But, uh, what they would do, they would have, at the labs, they would uh, have control groups, they would have pieces they would bake, pieces they would freeze, and then they would do destructive tests on them. As you can see on the left there, they, would, where they kind of would cut this wolf, this kind of spiderweb pattern into the figure. And there are several figures that exist out there with that pattern. So this is kind of, um, kind of it's a pattern that they would consistently use. And so they would know what group that these figures would come from. They would mark the bottoms of the feet. And so it, although there, there are some examples out there that exist with unmarked feet, generally most J slots, when you find them, they're gonna, if they're authentic, they're going to have little markings like that on the bottom. So what happened? Well, 
as you can see, just like the L's, there are different back designs. There's a long and there's a short stem. And I was talking to one of the um, testic technicians, and he told me that the long stems were not cutting it, that they were breaking and breaking very easily. That um, the slot was modified and that the short stems were holding up a little bit better, but that um, they canceled the project before they were able to do any further, um, further testing on them. And before I turn things back over to, uh, to Chris, you got, two, uh, you got a shot of two different missiles there. The ejector pin mark missile, which is the uh, prototype, which we also believe was probably done in-house at Kenner, next to the eight-sided missile that uh, was uh, sealed with the, um, the JSLOS that came in for testing. And I think that's me concluded there. So Chris. All right. Thanks, Brian. So now we've gone through concept, we've been engineering the figure, things ready to go. It's in a bag, it's got a mailer box. What else is going on? Well, that's in the engineering side. When you get on the marketing and sales side, they're excited about Boba Fett too. And you can see here in November, they had Boba Fett come visit Kenner. And they, everybody was psyched. There's all these photos, the sales staff taking photos. This is from a Kenner newsletter. And, um, you know, getting, getting the promotion going, very excited. Um, this is November. And while they're there, they do a little photo shoot. And you can see the middle photo is a photograph of the photographer taking the picture that ended up being the model for the artwork that was turned into the actual Boba Fett. So you see this now on retro card backs, the original card back. So there's a slightly blurry, blurry shot, but he's taking that that image that somebody turned into uh, the artwork. So a lot going on in Kenner there, November. What's special about November of 1978? This guy was going to be on TV, right? And uh, everybody was excited. Star Wars on TV, it was a big thing, right? This is like just a little over a year after Star Wars premiered in the theaters. And you know, back in those days, I mean, even the film lasted in some theaters for an entire year. But, you know, not like today where you can pause things, wait, you have so much content thrown at you. you know, this was like a big deal to have this going. It's a two-hour special. Um, one of the um, parts in it was going to be a t about a nine-minute animated segment where they were going to introduce Boba Fett. And, um, and Kenner knew this, and Kenner was very excited about the holiday special. Um, this is from some internal... Um, some marketing material sent out where they were telling uh, their retailers, hey, this, is this, this show is going to go out, 45 million people are going to see it. We've got this new 60-second commercial with C-3PO. The bottom says, unquestionably, the most extraordinary, most exciting commercial ever produced for a line of toys. I mean, they were <laughs> psyched. So, and any of you who have seen this um, uh, on YouTube, the holiday special, you know, you've seen this, Star this Kenner commercial. So they were jazzed. They were really psyched on this thing. So that was going on, but something else was happening in the fall of 1978. This guy, Battlestar Galactica, was out. And you can see right there a cover of Newsweek, Son of Star Wars. And it was sort of like, now Star Wars was on TV every week. But laser blasts, spaceships, you know, uh, and at the same time, the toys were ready to go. Unlike Star Wars, you know, the toys weren't ready immediately. With Battlestar Galactica, they were ready, and they were selling you know, in, in late summer, early fall, they started selling them. Um, the backbone of the toy line were these four vehicles. They all had one thing in common. They shot this little one and a quarter inch missile. And uh, all, you know, three of the vehicles, they had this bottlenose shape, which is going to be important as we get along here. But these toys were super popular. They, they were selling. They sold them, um, like a million of them even before Christmas time. And um, they were safety tested. They were, and you can see here, this is actually ages over three, and the Kenner toys say ages over four. So, you know, this had passed the, um, their safety test. All these vehicles are marked like this. And, uh, but the thing is, you know, with toys, and then Mattel had been selling missile firing toys. The Shogun Warriors we showed you, showed you earlier from like several years before that were missile firing, and Mego was selling missile firing uh, figures. But, they were selling a lot of these Battlestar Galactica figures. The missiles were small. The front end is very bottle shape. You get a lot of kids. You got more opportunities. And by December, you had three, well, the Consumer Product Safety Commission, Mattel went to them and said, hey, 
we, there's a problem happening. We're going to put these safety, this label on our toys. So they marked all their um, existing inventories with this sticker that says, do not point or fire the missile into your mouth or your face. Um, you know, but you have three-year-olds up, you know, and that thing's bottle nose, they are sticking this thing in their mouth and they are firing this to, to feel the kick, right? Um, so you have uh, <laughs> three reports and four potential of swallowed or aspirated missiles. Now, you know, you hear people like, oh, you know, kid choked on a movie. Aspirated means this is going into their lungs, right? These missiles are into their lungs. They had to surgically remove these missiles from their lungs. So not a big deal. But they didn't... <laughs> So far, I mean, all they're doing is saying, hey, we're agreeing to put this sticker that says don't point it to your mouth, and the Consumer Product Safety Commission is like, okay, sounds good to us, right? They still passed the safety test. Well, at the same time, so Kenner is, is in with these me committees and stuff, so they, on an the early version of their card back design, they printed it on there, do not launch the projectile towards your face. So... This is December, early December. You had these going on, the, the toys, the Battlestar Galactica stuff still selling like hotcakes, right? And more toys in the market, more opportunities for problems. And now you have the uh, Christmas selling season. And you have these kids shooting missiles into the mouths. And then what happened? The worst happened. December 29th, a four-year-old shot it into his mouth and he suffocated. It uh, cut off his windpipe, and uh, they found him unconscious and took him to the hospital, removed the missile, but he was brain dead. And two days later, they pronounced him dead. Um, the next one's a little bit morbid, but it's important information here. These are some pieces of the death certificate, some little, and you can see here, cause of death, asphyxia, brain death due to aspiration of missile. But the interesting thing for here for Star Wars, you, the, the, the medical examiner wrote Star Wars toy put into mouth, missile ejected into bronchial area. So, Jim, I wonder if uh, the, uh, Jim's, uh, uh, Jim Kipling, the, the Kenner's legal, would have probably freaked out if he knew that this was written. <laughs> well, yeah, the, the safety people at Kenner were, when this came out initially, we didn't get an autopsy report or anything. They immediately contact. It. I mean, it was generally if anything like this would ha even come close, they would be on it. Uh, Carl Wojohn ran the safety area then, and said, you know, first call us to the head of engineering, saying stop everything on the Star Wars rock firing Boba Fett, and that's what happened immediately. Uh, the marketing people were thinking about, well, we'll put a warning sign, but Carl had first. Uh, dibs on canceling the project. But I, and I hadn't heard that they actually called it Star Wars. What, but at the time, Star Wars was more top of mind than Paddle Scar Galactica, so. But we were, it, we had a number of toys over the time that I was in the marketing area where problems came up with the product. And we, we were very proactive. It was, and around the industry too, Mattel would have already contacted Kenner and all the other toy companies to tell them what had happened and what they were being sued. So the CPSC would have been in there, but the information would have traveled much faster than the CPSC. Yeah, yeah, and so Mattel did go into action. So uh, December 31st um, is when he was pronounced dead. A week and a half later, Mattel issues a recall on their Battlestar Galactica toys, and they had a nationwide print a a campaign in all the newspapers, um, the CPSC, Consumer Product Safety Commission guy was on the Today Show. They were talking about the dangers of the missiles. Um, they had this big recall program. And, uh, and you can see these, from these things, I, they, they even show you the missile. This, this could be hazardous. You know, we want you to, to get this from your kids. They had something called the Missile Mail-In Program, where they encouraged parents to take the missiles and send them to Mattel. Mattel would send them a Hot Wheels car. Um, or at the very least, they said, please destroy the missiles or throw them away. Uh, but at the same time, other parents are calling Mattel saying, we lost the missiles, we want to buy more missiles because our vehicles don't work. So, of course, that was going unfulfilled. Um, Mattel redesigned the toys, and now they had a different sticker where they say, hey, the redesigned toys and missiles cannot be launched. They changed the missile design and, and assembled the missile into the vehicle, so when you clicked it, 
the, mis the missile just barely clicked forward. So you'd hear that click sound, but it didn't launch. And, uh, and by this time now, we have 10 incidents of swallowed or aspirated missiles, and then the one death I mentioned here, and redesigned vehicles. And just, just sort of just as interesting, like by, by April, it had gone up to 27 reports of this swallowed or aspirated missile. So this was really a thing that, that was happening. The one thing I found interesting is like they have this missile mail-in program. They actually put an expiration date of March. It's like, what the heck? You're trying to get these in. Why are you cutting this off in March? You know, you give them two. Anyway, I thought that was interesting just reading through there. So anyway, so that's uh, early January. So as Jim noted, you have, uh, Kenner was right in on this, and they they were pulling it. So by Toy Fair, February '79, they're they're showing uh, their new Boba Fett figure in their display. This is a photo of the actual Kenner showroom display for the Star Wars uh, line from that Toy Fair, and you can see the the, the zoom in area there. There's a loose Boba Fett figure and a Boba Fett on card. Um, you can see the packaging behind there. They've, they've put the sticker over the warning, but nothing's mentioned. There's no rocket firing mentioning there. Um, the catalog they offered, uh, they have a lot of blank space in there where they talk about Boba Fett has a laser rifle and a backpack. So it's like, yeah, a backpack. They just took the text off that said with rocket firing feature. You know, you can see there was just old school. They would have just erased that text and continued. Because most of the stuff would have been going forth for for Toy Fair, for production. So they, they had to do what they could to you know, turn things around. And luckily, most of these shots of Boba Fett are from the front, so you don't really see. Um, but one interesting thing is that Toy Fair photo, that figure did, it turned up like in 19, late 1999. The guy who got it from the wall approached a collector and then went through the community. It turns out it was an actual rocket firing Boba Fett figure attached to the card back. Um, it was an early version of the card back. It was a completely mocked up figure and it was like oh my gosh this thing this handmade figure and but in toy fair you wouldn't have seen that they, they didn't talk about the missile firing feature but when you zoom in there you can see that it was one of those and um, some of you may have seen this in, a few, in 2016 it was on Pawn Stars you know because Pawn Stars is completely made up right there was no intention to really sell this but they like it's for history channel they like showing historical things but the guy brought the figure in and they did their little deal so um, but that's the figure um, that's the guy who bought it um, the first time it was really sold so um, pretty famous there um, you can see they were negotiating he, he wanted 150 grand they didn't make a deal so anyway so what happens they redesigned the figure like Jim said they 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 Redu they got rid of the firing mechanism. They retooled it, um, took, the, took the missile firing feature out, and this is a photograph of an early prototype that shows um, with no rocket firing. Um, they still retain that eight-sided missile. They just made it so that the missile uh, wouldn't launch. And what happened to the rest of them? <laughs> they crushed these things. Uh, uh, not every one of them, but yeah, and they were there was an order to like destroy what you can. We don't know how many they actually destroyed. Um, we just know they didn't do them all. But they there was they actually put them in the, the crusher there at, at Kenner. And we didn't know. use that crusher. <laughs> <laughs> you didn't use this one, yeah. The, the real crusher photo would have been pretty boring anyway. So we, uh, what happened? Kenner mailed this guy out, plain Boba Fett, a little baggy with a note that said the launcher has been removed from the product for safety reasons. And uh, that's my box, see, got my name on it. Uh, still have that one. Not the bag, I opened that thing immediately, but I was definitely, <laughs> dis I was definitely disappointed. I was nine years old and I was waiting that things in the mailbox. It's like, ah, and I opened it up. I was like, it does not look anything like the picture they showed when I sent off for this thing, right? With that rounded guy, but um, the design. Anyway, but, a little bit of rocket firing Boba Fett still exists. If you look at your own figures, especially the very first ones, the Hong Kong ones, you see all those indentations on the back. You can see that that's where they had changed the, the mold. And those areas where, where, where the plastic is a little bit thin in the mold, they didn't completely fill it in. And that's where, um, that's the remnants of the J slot that was still left over. And you can see that. You look at your Boba Fett figure and look in the back and you can see, and that's, that's the remnants of, of the thing. So. Um, and that's where we are. We had it, it was coming, 
and then they took it away. For, I mean, it, it was probably the right call. I mean, <laughs> you know, it was a... <laughs> Uh, but one thing is, seriously, they do not fire well at all. I mean, the, the Boba Fett figure, it's like, it's like putting a pencil into a tin cup. You just turn it over, and it falls out. There's nothing that clicks the missile into it. And the, the eight-sided version does fire a little bit better than the four, but usually, and, but it's all completely one solid, like a crayon, where the Battlestar Galactica missile was weighted on one, and it was heavy and it had a tail. It would actually shoot, and this thing just kind of tumbles. So it's... It would have been kind of just, it would have been disappointed, I think, if they released it the way it was. Anyway, but um, so what's next here? People often ask, and I see this on the, I'm in the internet, right? 30 years of researching this and being into Star Wars and seeing people spouting off details and things. You guys can spout off details. Now, you, you know all this stuff, and this is how it happened, but how many are around? About 100 of these things are known to exist. Um, of the basic L slot, which is that the reverse L shape, and of the J, you can see the breakdown, about 30 of the J's, about 70 of the L. Once in a while, one will turn up out of the blue, and I would say in the last three or four years, maybe seven have turned up from like sources that can't say how they got it, how it ties back to Kenner, but it actually, you know, once it's gone through a few people to look at, it's like, these are legit. Most, most prototypes, you know, you, you, it really helps to trace it back to a Kenner source, but um, they're around um, in collections. Um, but so, yeah, we're looking at about 100. And the other things people ask, everybody asks me, but, you know, you show them your toy collection. What's it worth? Well, in the past few years, this has been an interesting thing. There's been some amazing prices achieved on these in auction. You can see from 2019 to 2022, what some of these have sold for. Um, it's been pretty astounding. Um, and it's interesting, I was just talking with Brian earlier about, you know, like this, we were going to get this rocket firing Boba Fett that you could play with, and then they took it away and they, they glued the figure into it. And now these, some of these prototypes exist, but now they're taking the prototypes and they're encasing them in acrylic. So you get back to the point where you can't fire a missile on it anyway. So. <laughs> Anyway, so that's, we're in good time here. Anyway. So, uh, don't get up yet. Don't, don't, don't run out yet. Does anybody have any questions? I don't know what, because we told you everything. There's nothing left to know. All right, what's... Oh, so the li he mentioned the Lily Letty removable rocket fed. So in Mexico, the licensee that made the figures there was Lily Letty instead of Kenner. Um, they're not going to let you out the door yet to get your star tots until we're done. Um, anyway, uh, so <laughs> they, they uh, it's sort of like in the Jedi time frame. They're, they made their, their rocket with a little, like a little fin in it. And they actually, some of the earlier versions, they, they put the rocket in and sort of twist it into position. And they didn't uh, weld those into place. So you can get some of those figures where the rocket twists and comes out. Um, it's not firing. It just doesn't glue into the backpack. So there is that. It's, it's sort of like an interesting in-between um, version that, that a lot of collectors have chased, chased down. Two over there. Mr. Two. Steve. Okay. Do we know if the uh, carded toy fair is a J or not? The carded toy fair figure is a J slot. So very close to the, what the, the production figure would have been. Copyright dates, like Brian mentioned, factory paint with that final design. I mean... If the Battlestar Galactica stuff had not happened, that's what we would have gotten, that, that J-slot uh, version. I saw a hand over here earlier. Oh, there's one right here. How were the missiles attached when they first released, and when did they first change from that? How were the missiles attached? Um, in the, the production toy that you got, they were just, like, glued in or sonic welded into the back of the backpack. So they were glued in. Yeah. Uh, but they're actually, I have a, hold on. We got a lot of photos here. I'll show you the ones that we, 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 we ran, ran, I ran short on time. Oh, this is an interesting one. When they were doing that photo, they used that uh, Star Wars beach towel <laughs> as his poncho. Uh, yeah, I should have shown some of these that we, got, we cut for time. Um, uh, so this is a photo I took. I, I pried this thing open myself. So on the inside, I got, so I was mentioning the, the, like the Letty, Letty fit, the, 
Letty figure, the, the rocket with the fin on it. Well, I had one that I had pried out. It was just barely glued, and I got one out. You can see that the Kenner added that little fin to give a mechanical lock, and I mentioned how the, the, the slot was changed. They, they got rid of the slot, but the inside was still there, and you can see if you were to pry open one of those Boba Fett's, the inside where that fin was stuck in one of them, and I twisted out, and you can see that piece of fin stuck into that, um, that slot. And that gives like a mechanical lock for them to then in the assembly process go to the point where they're going to actually, um, I think these were sonic welded, not glued, where they, where they, they, they subject the part to high um, ultrasonic sound waves and the parts rub together and they melt together and that, that's how it welds. Did that continue for a long time? Yes, it did it continue and then they kept doing it like that at that point, yes. Who's your dad? John Howison. John That's the, you know, we've talked to John Howison. I met, I've been to your house a long time ago. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, it was like 2000 or so. It's been a while. Uh, yeah, Jim. Were you looking for rocket fire in Boba Fett? Yes. Yes. <laughs> John, actually, John, he sold them all. Yes. Yeah, so John, actually, and there was a Tomart. We still got 11 minutes. Oh, we're good on time. I thought we'd run long. Um, Tomart Action Figure Digest. In the 90s, you know, you didn't have, you basically got all this the collecting information from some magazines, and they did a print magazine every month. Um, and they were based out of Dayton, Ohio, which is close to Cincinnati, Ohio, which is where Kenner was based. So um, and they worked closely with a dealer there that was finding stuff from, from, from employees, and they would find prototypes, and they would show them off in the magazine. Um, in part just to show cool things, and also in part as a sort of like, a, it was a free advertising for the dealer who had these items. And, and I think it came, your mom was talking to your dad, hey, do you have any of these figures? These things are worth money. These people are advertising. And he came forth and he had the J-slot. He was the first person, they showed the J-slot. That was the first time the, Kenner, uh, the collectors had ever seen that more finished version. And I think that was like 1990 six or so when that happened and he sold some at the time he still kept one because when we visited him we bought that last one so that was great it's good that he held on to that he uh and that's how you find these things um try to contact some of these old kenner guys and hey not old kenner guys the former kenner employees yeah yeah there's a question over there oh one more question front row Who is shooting into their mouths? Good well, how old are you? You're eight. Well, little boys about your age were shooting it into their mouths. <laughs> They're crazy. Yeah, boys are crazy like that. Yeah, they were. That was the Battlestar Galactica toy. They didn't get to shoot this one into their mouths. But yeah, that's it. Oh, right here. Do I own any? I have one. Yes. Oh, yeah, sorry. I meant... And Brian has some. I have a few. <laughs> Jim never kept the, the, the kit bash fed. That has never turned up. Um, the white whale. Yeah, I, I turned it over to engineering, and who knows where it went after that. Yeah. Yeah, it, it was and, supposed to, yeah, it was supposed to be returned to the morgue. And then when the morgue got broken up, if it was there, someone may have it. But it's not me. Yeah, and the Kenner Morgue is where they would like take their uh, models and samples and stuff. It's sort of like their archive. They called it the Morgue. It sounds a little bit morbid, but uh. um, Gus wanted me to point out in the Rancho Obi Wan exhibit, there's a couple of rocket firing Boba Fett's on display. If you guys want to see legit ones, there may be one or two for sale on the show floor. We don't know who has those. <laughs> but their booth number is? But the booth number is uh, 1247. 1247. <laughs> Not a shameless plug. We probably wouldn't have gotten to that if we didn't have so much time extra. I saw another. Oh, there's another hand. Yeah, so the, he wants to know about, man, he's advanced questions over here. He's, 
Um, the Boba Fett on card was a J-slot J Boba Fett. It still exists. It's in a collection owned by a person I saw earlier today in here. I won't make him raise his hand, but I'm pretty sure he's in here. I see him. I just saw him. It still exists. <laughs> so, yeah, it's very neat. It's passed only through two. It went through a dealer and then uh, the guy that you saw on Pawn Stars to where it's sitting now with other Boba Fett figures and another L slot Boba Fett, I think. So sometimes people, collectors are a little bit, you know, like, oh, I got this version, but I need this version too. It's not enough to have one Holy Grail. You got to have the variation of the Holy Grail. <laughs> But, but at now at a 200 grand a piece, eh, it's not happening as much. So, um, anyway, are we good? Oh, I think we have another one over here. Would, would this film have had a, uh, a say, perhaps, if the decision of the, the current decision on the state to remove the plot? Would they have just called you guys? No. Yeah. <laughs> he said, would Lucasfilm have had a say in the, in the safety? Safety it, it, would be, they, they overruled a lot of that stuff. So, no, they wouldn't have had a say in it. They would have been notified immediately, but. No, no sale. Marketing wasn't allowed to have their two cents worth either. Safety first. How do we feel about the, 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 the Mandalorian shooting his rocket out? Man, just lean over and psh. Yeah, ask my wife about the whole like knee dart thing. Oh, yeah. That's. <laughs> she was like, what? <laughs> it's like an eight year old kid with that stupid thing. Anyway. She might be in the audience, too. So. <laughs> anyway, all right, we got six minutes. I don't think there's any. Okay, one more over here. So they re released it with the rocket firing, and the thought, what are the rules now as to when you, is it the size of the rocket that's the problem? Um, <laughs> they did re release, like, like they took, the, they, the one that came out several years ago, like the Kenner, like the rocket was like four inches long, and um, maybe that matters maybe because especially with that length it would shoot straighter but there, there's there's all kinds of missile firing things now so you know people forget things and they're like hey there's money to be made we'll make this version and you know different people running the yeah. cpsc well, the what cpsc has less clout than they yeah used to. less clout but you can go to the hasbro booth i'm sure i mean they have toys that shoot missiles so it's not like that was the end of missile firing toys all right Non-firing, like the prototypes that didn't have the mechanism, or like just like. The game with the oh, oh, we've never. I mean, you've seen that one that we showed earlier. Those like black and peach color. That prototype with, it just just they shot it in a different color. But at that point, it was like a production toy. So there's not many. There's not many vintage prototypes in Kenner that, that they made them in in weird colors. They usually tried to make them in the correct material and color, so they'd always have a representative um, of what the thing looked like. What do you think, know. Jim? Jim? Yeah. I'm not, I'm, that's, a, that's way beyond me. He's, always, yeah, he's a prelim design. He's like, you just yeah. get the concept, read the script, say, hey, here's, here's what we need to yeah. do, and he turn it over to the I, guys. I did that, the fun part, not the, <laughs> that dirty, dirty part. Yeah. And I, I, I could ask the product manager, but I haven't, I can ask him if he knows, if he's kept any of that in his brain. Because they may have, you know, he may know that, but yeah. What we, what we really just know, we, nowadays we just deal with what we know is in yeah. the marketplace and what's existing, you know, and things turn up, like I mentioned, several have turned up in the past few years from unrelated sources. Most things from Kenner sources have sort of started to dry up over the years and it's been fairly stable. But you never know, something turns up, but never like a batch. But one thing about prototypes is like when they have machine made things, you know, these are injection molded and, and factory made, you, you could have multiples turn up, but so far it hasn't been like that. It's been very limited. Anyway, four minutes, they're probably ready to go. Hope you guys had a good time with this. It was a <laughs>